Citizens Friday Forum. City Club is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place. I'm Greg McPherson, a City Club board member, and I would like to welcome members and guests alike, those of you who join us today at the Sentinel Hotel and those of you listening on OPB radio or watching on Portland Community Media. Today's Friday Forum will consider the architecture of Portland, but first, some announcements. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures that we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, uh, and our current Friday Forum sponsors, who are Chevron, Girding Eadlin, Morell Inc., Northwest Natural, the Portland Timbers, and Schwabe, Williamson, and Wyatt. We are grateful for their support and commitment to City Club's mission. Please join me in showing our appreciation. <laughs> City Club's annual membership drive is coming to a close soon. If you haven't acted already, this is the time to join. For 98 years, City Club has been shaping this community through research, advocacy and public forums, all driven forward by the talent and energy of our members. You can become part of this great effort. After today's forum, City Club staff will be at the door ready to sign you up as a member today. Next week, we will have our annual meeting, an opportunity to celebrate the achievements of the past year and set the foundation for the year to come. Doors open at 1045, that's earlier than usual, and the annual meeting will begin at 1115. Uh, our regularly scheduled program on what's next for water and sewer rates in Portland will begin at 1215 p.m. You can learn more about City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, City Club will be live tweeting at today's event. You can follow or mention us at PDX City Club, and be sure to follow the conversation by using the hashtag City Club in your own tweets. And now for today's program. Rarely in Portland's history have so many of its citizens been affected by architecture. New buildings, some bold, some beautiful, some middling, and a few downright ugly, are rising in nearly every neighborhood of the city. The city has a process, design review, to decide what buildings make the grade but its most stringent oversight only applies to downtown and a few other innermost districts. How does design review work? How well is it working? Should it be expanded to other parts of the city? Three prominent design advocates who have overseen the city's review during three distinct eras share their opinions about how to get the best buildings for the city. Our panelists today are Michael McCulloch, Guinevere Milius, and John Russell. The program will be moderated by Randy Gregg. Randy is a writer, editor, and organizer who has worked in the Northwest for the past 28 years. He is currently the director of the University of Oregon's John Yon Center and editor-at-large for Portland Monthly. Previously, Randy wrote on culture and urban issues for the Oregonian. He was a Loeb Fellow at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design and a National Arts Journalism Fellow at Columbia University. Please help me welcome today's guests. Thanks, Greg. Uh, it's great to see the room full. Um, uh, it's really uh, exciting to see so many people interested in design. Um, when I first began writing about architecture and urban design for the Oregonian back in the early 90s, I had to go to a lot of meetings in a really dreary building, the Portland building. But back in the, in, the, in, the, in the back of the dark old room C, which some of you may remember, um, there was a beautiful model of the entire city made of uh, gorgeous, uh, clear Douglas fir. And every developer and architect uh, going before the design commission by city code had to bring a scale model of their proposed building, carved in white, and they had to place it into the model. It was a thoughtful and, in many ways, important ritual. In essence, it started the proceedings of design review with a basic question. How will your building fit into our city? The model's still in the Portland building, uh, a little tattered and dusty, um, but the last new building added to it was around 1999. I visited it today, and it looked like it was uh, Pioneer Place 2. Um, 
the Design Commission now meets in, in the uh, 1900 Fourth Avenue building uh, where it is a tenant and the general services uh, didn't want to pay the extra rent for the 100 square feet or so uh, required for the model. Um, many other things have changed uh, since those days. Architects can create dazzling graphics that are virtually in indistinguishable from what the final building will look like. But the absence of placing that little wood carving into uh, of, your, of your building into the bigger wood carving of the city stands as, as a kind of metaphor to my mind. Every act of architecture is an addition to the whole of the city. Will this act make the city or will it make the city better or will it detract? For the last two years, as Greg said, the city of Portland's been seeing many acts of architecture, not just in downtown, but throughout the whole city and every neighborhood. Never b before in history have there been so many building permits uh, released. And every act of architecture is an addition to the whole of the city. Are these adding or are they detracting? The only entity that asks this question is the Portland Design Commission and the city's staff at the Offi Office of Development Services. The commission is made up of eight members of the public, architects, developers, and regular folks, and it reviews every new building or major alteration located in the central city and a smattering of the more urban neighborhoods. Elsewhere, the buildings are reviewed by the city staff. It has long been said that the city's design review process can't mandate great buildings, but it can prevent truly bad ones. But as I survey the Portland's current boom, particularly in the neighborhoods, I'm not so sure the latter is true anymore. One only needs stroll to the, port, put to the Pearl District to see how well design review can work, uh, where the sum has really become greater than the parts. Um, but more recently, elsewhere in the city, we're seeing additions that, uh, that really are, I think, subtracting from the city. So for today, we've brought three experts to talk about what's working in design review and what's not. They represent three different eras, the beginning, an important middle phase, and someone who's navigating the current boom. Since 1969, John Russell has uh, been, um, uh, has helped shape this, the city's skyline, first at Melvin Mark, and uh, then his own company, Russell Development Company. He served on, at the, in the Portland uh, Development Commission, the Planning and La Landmarks Commission, uh, but his two crowning achievements were the development of the PacWest Tower and the first LEED certified remodel of a multi-tenant building, the 200 Market Building. Mike McCulloch is an architect, urban designer, and developer who's been practicing in Oregon since 1976. He served on the Design Commission from 1996 to 2007 with five years as chairman. Most recently, he's completed master plans for the Rose Quarter, Oregon Convention Center blocks, and, the de and development proposals for Lentz, Gresham, and Beaverton. Guinevere Millis was appointed to the Design Commission in 2006 and has served as chair since 2010. She is the president of Parachute Strategies, a marketing and strategic planning firm, and she's also been steeped in the city's uh, uh, urban design and transportation politics as a volunteer, as just a regular citizen. Um, uh, working on the Pearl District Neighborhood Association's Planning and Trans Transportation Committee and TriMet's Willamette, Ri Bridge, Willamette River Bridge Advisory Committee. Um, so I, wanna, uh, I want everybody to be aware, you know, we can get pretty wonky about this stuff, and I've told our panel no acronyms and no, uh, uh, no lingo. Um, and I'm inviting uh, you in the audience to be the police. Raise your hand if we, if we slip, uh, and we'll clarify it. Um, and today we've agreed that we have two audience, two audiences. The general public, those who are going to be listening on OPB uh, for this discussion, and City Hall. So we're going to start with a little history and what each of these folks thinks is the fundamental value of design review. And we're going to end up with a verbal uh, memo of improvements we hope the good folks at City Hall and the 1900 Fourth Avenue building will hear. John? Well, I'd like to say that my wife and I have gotten accustomed to being asked, how did that happen? Because we've been around for a long time. Um, I think one important preamble, all three of us, I think I can speak for all of us, are wildly enthusiastic about the concept of design review. And although we may quibble around the edges, and I think that's the purpose of this, that shouldn't obscure the fact that the concept is something we endorse. Um, I like to think that design review happened 
uh, when I was on the Planning Commission. A building came in front of us that is now known, I think, as Congress Center, then the Urbanco Building. And we were given an eight and a half by 11 sheet. That was the entire elevation of the building. And we were asked three questions. The only three questions the Planning Commission was asked to ask, if you will, answer. Does it meet the height? Does it meet the maximum of the parking ratio? Uh, and is it, does it meet the floor area ratio? Clearly, that building did. But it bothered me enormously that the corner of 6th and Salmon, if you can think about that, is where Nike Town used to be, that corner was opposite I Magnus, and again, it's all gone, but that was the prim premier department store. And that building it still has, at the corner, 15 feet of granite, and on 6th, no shop fronts at all, and on salmon, your, act, your eye level is at, a, at, at the floor, between two floors, a basement and a first floor. And uh, so I said to my fellow commissioners, this building is gonna be around for 100 years, it's damaging to its neighbor, neighbor, uh, neighbors, and we need some ability to get a subjective judgment, uh, not a prescription, but a subjective judgment about particularly how these buildings should work at the ground floor, because that's, the ground floor is what separates urban buildings from suburban buildings. Urban buildings are meant to be a, a pleasure, pleasure to walk by. So that's how it happened. And I guess Randy asked us to talk about one success. And the, the one that occurs to me is the Fox Tower. And you look at its frontage on Broadway, it has the two most important characteristics that we uh, promulgated way back when. Its entrance is at the center, and the, re and the retailers are at the corners, because the retailers, the corner is the only place where you actually face a building rather than just see it out of the side of your eye. And Fox Tower uh, is a, just a wonderful building and a credit to a very important neighbor in Nordstrom's. So, uh, that's how it happened. Mike, you want to tell us a little bit about the evolution of it in your, uh, during your tenure? Okay. So I can talk about the middle years um, a little bit. And uh, I, I came to Oregon as uh, an architect because this kind of discussion was going on. And because it wasn't uh, a place in which uh, you had to wait forever in a back room somewhere or in line at a particular um, institution to be given the opportunity to say something about the built environment, that we participate here. We, we talk about it at the neighborhood level. Uh, we talk about it uh, professionally between, between professionals, and we work our planners and our politicians pretty hard about how this city is made. So I came here to join that. And so design review seemed to me to be the perfect place in which to participate in this discussion and being a designer to um, affect that discussion a little bit. So if you, if you think about it, uh, design review is one of the few places in town where the issues of design, of color, texture, balance, feeling, emotions, uh, what we're making um, as a game board for our children and, and fellow citizens to play on uh, is, is discussed. The neighborhood groups, come and testify, the developers who I, you'll hear me say are arguably the leaders and um, bear the most responsibility and take the most risk, and then the planners and, and uh, designers uh, review all of that. So what I saw when I got to design review was um, a situation in which we were spending a little bit too much time being uh, convinced by design teams who were coming into the commission and saying, look at this, we've thought of everything, and here are all these perfect solutions, and it's just totally beautiful, and we're gonna do this song and dance that will just make you weep, and you'll just, everyone will say, yes, we, we want this. Well, it turns out that if you didn't say yes, um, then the team who had spent all this time and effort um, was kind of back to square one. 
And so what we tried to do was to adjust the process to make it work more the way that the review pro process, to make it work more the way uh, the architectural design process works, which is starting with concepts, where are you gonna put the tall part of the building, where are you gonna put the entry, where does the alleyway go, what basic materials are you gonna use, then come to design commission and talk about that. And that gives the, the commission and the city the ability to affect uh, the situation part way through. And, and it also introduces out of town developers or owners to the way Portland thinks and what's important to Portlanders. So we instituted something called the DAR, the Design Advisory Request. And uh, at this point I should say, your design commission uh, over all these years has been peopled by um, professionals who really care about the city. We get arguably the, the best professionals to donate their time to do this. Um, so between Lloyd Lindley and um, Jeff Joslin, who managed the design commission back then, and, and a host of others, we recrafted that, um, that process. And today, I think that process is clogging a little bit, but as John said, I think all three of us up here would say, don't throw this baby out with the bathwater. We just, we, we need to tune it. The city is very busy and growing now, so we, we just have to make sure that the process is as effective as it can be. And uh, we have some suggestions for that. Real quick, Mike, uh, could you identify uh, a, a real success of the design advice request, this early phase critique? Uh, I think a, a success of the design advisory request was probably Director's Park, um, looking at it carefully about, well, what's the big plan here? What's the idea here? Are there gonna be buildings in the park? Uh, what kind of elements should we have in the park? And I think the commission looked at it carefully and um, agreed and disagreed with some of the design proposals, but mostly the commission was there to underscore the, the deep, uh, civic importance of that space and taking the space all the way to the faces of the buildings, um, to making it a place that's in contrast to Pioneer Square, but um, a kind of a complement. And so I think the, the commission was very clear on those issues and I, th and I think the designers uh, carried that out uh, quite well. Gwen, you've, uh, you've had to uh, steer through two uh, economic extremes from the depths of the recession in which any building meant jobs um, to this crazy time we're experiencing now. Tell us about how it's been going. Right. Okay, so um, as Randy mentioned, first I wanted to thank the City Club for having um, all of us here today. Um, I'm a longtime member and volunteer, and so I'm humbled to be before you. And thank you, Patty Tillett, for bringing us together. You're a civic treasure all to yourself, so thank you. Um, yes, so my first design review hearing was in late 2006, and it was eight hours long. Um, starts at 1.30 in the afternoon, and it just goes until you're done. And um, it was a busy time. We were seeing a lot of condominiums, as many of you remember. Um, we were seeing a lot of kind of frothy projects, and we were... Um, just flattened by the load. And I was a new commissioner at that time and, and getting my feet underneath me. So it was, a, it was a stunning time really to be involved in the commission. One night in 2007, we reviewed a million square feet of real estate just that night, um, reviewed and approved. So it was pretty uh, different <laughs> when the crash came. Things really slowed down. We went from two hearings a month to sometimes one I remember one month when there was none, and we had hearings where we would be seeing a smaller neighborhood project that was being appealed by the neighborhood association for things like where the gate was placed for the pedestrians, and then really big public projects like the giant bridge across the Willamette River that you're seeing today. So it was a really strange time, and it was frankly difficult to be the standard bearer for quality and permanence when you knew that every project that came in was hanging on by its fingernails. Everyone was having a hard time. So uh, 
getting out of that mindset into the boom years was a bit of a transition for all of us, and I think we're making that transition successfully. What you realize when you've been through a boom and a bust and a boom again is that the pressures don't really change. Every project is in a hurry to get out of the ground. Every developer and architecture team wants to get it done as fast as they can. Every developer team really feels like they've done everything they can. And in some cases they have, and in some cases you can push them a little harder. But the truth is, is that as a design commission, we have to pay attention to not just the problems of today and the issues of today, but what's this building going to be like in 50 years or 100 years? Will we want it there in 50 years or 100 years? We have a design guideline that shows up in every set of design guidelines around the city, and it has to do with quality and permanence. A building has to be of quality and permanence. It's not quality and permanence when the economy is good or when the developer isn't in a hurry. And so we have to keep reminding ourselves of that, that we have this responsibility uh, to be stewards of the public realm. A clear recent success for you? So a clear recent success. As a lot of you know, what's being built in Portland right now is apartment buildings. I'd say 90% of what we're seeing today is apartments. And unfortunately, apartment construction is getting a bad reputation around town for a lot of reasons that we can talk about today. Um, but I can think of one particular project that has been built um, right in between Old Town and the Pearl. It's the Art House apartments, which is um, a very relatively quiet apartment building, but when you study it, it's really quite well done, and it's well done for some reasons that uh, are consistent throughout projects that we end up greenlighting really fast, and they are projects that use a few time-tested, high-quality materials well, and projects that are very sensitive to how the ground floor is treated um, and how the pedestrian zone around a building is treated. And what I think is a hallmark of Art House is that it's not a building that's meant for the wealthy. It's a building that has relatively modest sized apartments for art students. And so I think it's a great example of how uh, a building can be inserted into a neighborhood and inject life into a neighborhood and be beautiful um, and not even necessarily for the wealthy. That's, I think it's a hallmark of a great project recently. And for those of you who don't know where that's at, it's on the North Park blocks where Powell's technical books used to be. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think, generally speaking, everybody I have spoken with is a fan of, of design review, but everybody admits that there are problems. And, and in the, my 15 years or so of covering design review, there's always been problems. There's always been heartburn. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, uh, now that you've, you all have had a lot of perspective on this, what would you identify as one or two really key problems that need to be solved at, at this point in time? John, you want to start? Well, I, I can only do it by uh, an anecdote uh, in a specific building. Uh, if you're driving on McAdam northbound, you see on your right these three or four shimmering glass and metal buildings, 25 stories tall or so. And you see alongside it a what appears to be a stucco low building with flush windows, no real cornice. It's affordable housing. It doesn't need to say that it's affordable housing. It just, it just exudes that, and it doesn't need to happen. Um, and I have, having talked to fellow panelists in the city, I think everybody agrees that that was a missed opportunity. But the contrast in, the, in, the, in those buildings really uh, makes me want to avoid McAdam. Um, but uh, at the other end of the extreme, uh, in the Tudor Market Building, we wanted to move a glass wall out at a restaurant 18 inches. Design review staff said, well, the rules are that will take us eight weeks to give you an answer because we have to write a report up, we have to mail it to all the neighbors, we have to wait for them to appeal or not, and then we'll write another report. There needs to be some way that some obviously de minimis issue can get resolved by the staff. I mean, these are people with master's degrees or PhDs 
they ought to be able to resolve that in a much more expeditious way. We just went ahead and did it and took our chances. We didn't wait the eight weeks, uh, you understand, <laughs> but it was a chance. We're going to come and look at that after this. <laughs> Mike. Um, I, I would say, and I, I'm glad that Sam is still in the room here. Oh, sorry, Sam. Um, the, w what I saw happening with design review was that um, planning and urban design uh, at the city staff level had gotten kind of separated from the, um, the design commission discussions. And so I was always, as chair, I was always looking for um, the planning staff to come in and say, well, um, this is what we're trying to achieve in the neighborhood. And, and give us some urban design guidelines to, okay, so if, if the entries aren't on the corner, if they're mid-block, um, what is that helping three blocks in every direction? And that became my mantra in, in the design commission was look three blocks in every direction. So I think w we have plenty of confidence at the um, urban design staff level. I know Mark and Troy are here and they've done a fabulous job. Um, but I think we need to reintegrate uh, their work with the, the work of the Design Commission. And the, the main thing about that is that if you don't have an, a clear understanding of that context as a Design Commissioner, you have to make it up. And so you've got, you've got seven people making it up. And you can tell that the uh, applicants are chafing over that, and then the discussions go on and on and on. So conversely, if you have these really clear directives and you stay within the discussion boundaries, um, design commission's gonna work much better. So it's, it's, a, it's a fine tuning issue, but it, but it also, to me, brings in more of the considerable resources that we have in this city. And I, I wanna add just one other thing to that, which is I think this process and the fabric of Portland is in fact our brand. The number of, the, of groups that we all have toured around that come from all over the planet to, how did you do this? How do you do, oh, oh, this is such a wonderful city. How did you get it to be this way? Well, it's through all these difficult negotiation processes and the, the uh, connection of planning with individual design with urban design, that's all. Gwen, what's your diagnosis? Well, uh, being in the thick of it, I know there are any number of problems, and I concur with both um, John and Mike on what they have to say about it. Um, one of the things that happens to me quite often is I get buttonholed by friends and neighbors who say, how could you have let that got built? <laughs> and the thing is, is that I now live in a neighborhood that doesn't enjoy design review. And uh, it, I'm afraid that the introduction sort of made it sound like we're actually looking at almost every building that gets built in the city of Portland on some level. Either a planner is doing it or, or you know, the design commission sees it and that's just not the case. Certainly city planners look at buildings outside of design districts to make sure they conform to code. And um, I think that design and development teams are encouraged to talk to neighborhood associations but I understand that what happens is that it's a perfunctory visit often, and it's kind of a, hey, I just had to come and talk to you, I don't have to listen to you kind of visit. And so there's actually a number of neighborhoods that are seeing a boom right now that don't have design review, and buildings are just going up, and people are squawking about it, of course. And there's just no say in the quality of those projects. Um, in other instances, in the neighborhoods, there's an opportunity to do what's called a prescriptive path, which means it's called the community design standards, and you have this checklist, and it, you have to have a building, or, you know, the building has to have a bottom, a middle, and a top, and it has to have a cornice, and it has to, you know, if you check all the things off on the boxes, then you can build your building. And sometimes great architecture comes out of that, but often it's pretty middling architecture, or really not great architecture. And so I think that those design standards, which are now over 20 years old, often don't reflect the reality on the ground in the neighborhoods where they're being used. And I think they need an update. Um, so I've just said, basically, I think the city needs more design review and um, probably a closer look at the design standards. And then I say that simultaneously knowing that my commission is doing 
two, six, seven, eight hour hearings a month with the reading that goes along with that, sometimes a third one every month, and that we, I know that the city staff is busier than they have ever been. We are beyond capacity. So I think that we would need to look at the entire system and um, think about how we can build more activism in our architecture community on these questions and more citizen activism, more people like me who are not trained architects who have an interest in the fabric of their neighborhoods to step up and frankly volunteer their time to protect the fabric of their neighborhoods. And I'm hoping um, to start some of those conversations this summer, but you know, it's, I'm not saying there's an easy answer. So let's, uh, let's talk about some solutions. There are one, two, or three things that you could, you could bring to the table right now. If you, uh, John Russell, if you were king, what would you change? Well, I, I would, um, I would first of all strive to get rid of the uh, de minimis kinds of things and empower the staff to make those decisions, uh, you know, relatively quickly. Um, in with it, with with two interests, one, it helps the, the project get underway, and two, it just saves ta staff time, and. Um, and secondly, when we, when we passed design review initially, city council said it's not going to take effect until we, city council, have passed what you, how you're going to review. And what we, what we proposed and what city council adopted was laughably simple. Uh, it was 21 goals. And I can tell you, having appeared in front of design commission, you can't always meet those goals as we know. I mean, they're extenuating circumstances. And um, so you can, that's one end of the spectrum. You have a, a number of goals with a very subjective evaluation of whether you meet them. At the other end of the spectrum is what Seattle has done, and I showed my fellow panelists what, what Seattle has done. It's like the Gutenberg Bible with more words than you can imagine about it, so it's pr very, very prescriptive. And I think Gwen is right. It, a, a prescriptive design review regulation doesn't force good buildings as much as it eliminates uh, creativity uh, in, in, in buildings. So I, I guess I favor the more subjective goals uh, than the more prescriptive solutions. Mike? Um, well, there are two things that I want to say about changes. One is that in the early earlier days of the Design Commission, one of the things that at least I introduced the meetings with was to say, um, as a development team and as a design team, if you do something that is so cool but doesn't meet the present guidelines, it just you just do this total end run, we will all stand up and salute. So that is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from the prescriptive. The prescriptive is the net that catches the worst stuff. But I think we have to encourage um, the really creative uh, out there thinking. And in order to do that, I think we have to reinforce the design advisory request because nobody wants to draw up this totally cool rocket ship that the c commission um, eventually vetoes. So uh, encouraging the, the unique and the creative and the sort of out of the, outside the box. Um, this, the second thing is for, for the mayor and others to be really diligent in uh, appointing the right people to the commission because it's a really tough job and you, it's not something that you should just sort of show up and read the packets and do this. It's a, it's a serious commitment, and so uh, continuing to get the good level of people um, is, is, a, is another major, major thing that I think we have to constantly be aware of. Gwen, you're the boss. <laughs> well, a couple of things. I would like to see... Um, 
we see a lot of neighbors come to our hearings um, unaware that their neighborhood had the zoning capacity for the size of buildings they're seeing, and they're unaware of parking regulations, which incidentally we have no control over. Um, and uh, I'd like to get to a place where we have a more informed public uh, who are more aware of what can happen in their neighborhoods. And I also want to be a more informed commission member and be uh, more aware of what's really going on on the ground at foot speed in neighborhoods. And to that end, my uh, I actually just buttonholed Steve Pinger, who's in the audience here, a former employer of mine, um, who is at Northwest District Association, to take the commission on a tour this summer of his neighborhood and talk about what works on the ground floor and what doesn't, and look at some of the projects that have been recently built in their neighborhood and talk about, you know, what's pleasing and what isn't, and be there on the ground as a design commissioner, potentially invite some planning commissioners, um, potentially invite some planning staff, and be there with our eyes and ears open and our mouths closed mo mostly to listen to what the neighborhoods have to say. Um, that is a first step, I think, on the road to kind of knitting, better knitting together the commissions that are, are supposed to represent the city and the people they're representing. And um, I think there just needs to be more of that and uh, better liaison between planning commission and design commission. There used to be eight design commissioners. There are only seven now because there was a spot where somebody was supposed to both sit on the planning commission and the design commission, and it's almost impossible to find somebody with that kind of time, uh, frankly, so to volunteer that kind of time. So we've had kind of less and less liaison between the people that are actually deciding what we do with parking or at least recommending to city council what we do with parking and the size of buildings and the kind of major moves that all of our neighborhoods are making being decided at the planning commission level and then we get to basically enforce how that looks in design and uh, it's awkward when there isn't a lot of talk between those two bodies. I want to add a couple of things. I emailed um, uh, some folks uh, who weren't on the panel, some younger uh, designers who've only gone through the process you know, a couple of times. And, and I thought some of their insights were really interesting. Um, uh, one, you know, I, there's really nobody speaking up for the developer uh, in this. I mean, we, we all like to sort of dish on developers and imagine they're evil and they're just going to make a lot of money. But you, you have to realize uh, you know, that there's a tremendous amount of risk involved in development. And uh, one of the complaints um, is that the, the amount of effort that it takes to get through design review necessitates a huge expenditure of money. Um, and that that process is, is, you know, it's not graduated in a way uh, that uh, yields a certainty that you're making it through that process. That more uh, firm critique, more um, deep critique at the start of the process when there's only been a little money on the table would make a lot more sense. So essentially making the design ad advice request, giving it greater teeth. Uh, that same designer uh, said that by virtue of the fact that there's really, nobody ever gets told no in the end, that your building's not good enough that that sort of uh, opens the door to thinking you can just wear down the commission. And I certainly, in my time of covering it, have, have seen that. Um, and so kind of finding a middle ground between uh, um, you know, making that first 100,000 or so um, you know, worth it and, and understand whether or not you can move forward would really help things a lot. And then another designer uh, I, I thought had just a really um, wonderfully pragmatic uh, 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 suggestion. I wish the packages that they sent out to the public mailings didn't make even the greatest pro project look terrifying. We, we spend more time trying to ed educate upset neighbors due to poor quality images sent out with the notice than anything else. Uh, uh, and it's really true. You get those, and it's, it is pretty terrifying. Um, I want to uh, go ahead and move on to uh, 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 questions, because I want to kind of give our panel a chance to uh, summarize for their memo to City Hall. Uh, so uh, please come up, and, and um, uh, we have some rules around the questions. You have to be a member. Uh, that's a benefit of membership, uh, being able to ask a question at the mic. Uh, please identify yourself, and uh, keep your question to 30 seconds, and make sure that it has a question mark at the end. Who wants to be first?
Mr. Tillich. Uh, Paddy Tillich, City Club member. When the design review process began, you had, as you said, 21 guidelines to, to, to go on. That was the basis. And something that happened around the time of the Central City Plan in the mid-'80s was that everything somehow had to be turned into a rule or a regulation. And it seems to me that the, uh, the, the clearest way to make this simple again and to allow the kind of subjective evaluation that Gwen talked about is to set aside regulations that those can be administered by the city and accept only the design guidelines and make that the responsibility of the design commission so you then have the latitude to really talk about the civic qualities of the building, what it does and doesn't do for, for the city. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Well, I, I have an opinion about that, Patty. Um, I'm on the West Quadrant plan, which is re redesigning or replanning re the central city on the west side of the Willamette. And uh, in our most recent meeting, there was a discussion about what characteristics the gold block, when it's developed, should have. And a lot of the people in the audience said, we need to get those regulations in the zoning code. And that is a disaster because the appeal if you don't meet the zoning code, you basically are destined to city council. And you talk about a, uh, a real uh, way to make sure you don't have creativity is to put something in the zoning code. Um, so in a, in a sense, if you want good buildings, you can either do nothing, you can, you can have goals that are subjective, which is what I think the Design Review Commission is about, or you can put it in the zoning code. And if you put it in the zoning code, you better, you better be darn sure that those regulations meet every possible circumstance, which they probably can't. But if, because if, if they don't, then it's uh, a real restriction on creativity. Did that answer your question? Anybody else want to take a swing at that? I, I think the developer covered it pretty well there. <laughs> Good question. Gwen, you, you talked about the time that the brewery blocks came, and I think that would be illuminating because, as I, as I remember, you said it just, it, the building, buildings were so well done that it just cruised through. No eight hour meeting. That was actually Mike's time, and I remember that was, I, I was involved in the I, Pearl District I, then, and yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, John, because th there was a, a, an example of a three block really complicated project that was on a very tight time track. And I, I, you know, I don't want to characterize the design commission as just all standing up in unison and applauding, but basically that's kind of what happened because here was a design team that understood uh, what, what the city was about, local design team, and I, I want to refer to local in a, in a second too, local design team uh, they preserved a whole series of the original brewery blocks buildings. Uh, they respected uh, the urban and pedestrian environment, and it was a case in which uh, I felt as though the design commission should just stand back and l let them do it. We, we looked at it very carefully, but a three-block project, I think it went through in two hearings. And so th what that is, is it's a, that is a caveat to... Um, the developers out there who, if you really get it and you really understand what to do, um, you can get through this process um, much more quickly than you think. And um, I, I think we would all agree that that was a, it was, it was a unique time and, and it was a unique set of circumstances, but um, it's, it's very doable to go through design commission that quickly. So the last thing I want to say about, about local developers is that I think all of you should really look carefully at who's here in the audience and who's here in this city building buildings and writing these checks and taking these risks and going through these processes. It's primarily local people whose kids walk to school with your kids and they, they feel that way about it. And, and that's one of the reasons that Portland has succeeded as uh, admirably as it has in creating um, a cultural context and a built context that really reflects our, our culture. 
the out-of-town developers uh, face some real challenges. At Design Commission, we, <laughs> we dealt with Tiffany's. Tiffany's is a franchise. We dealt with um, Hilton. Hilton's a franchise. But their franchise buildings are very different here than they are in other cities. So, Next question. Yeah, my name is Rick York, and I'm a City Club member. And what I'm about to say may be a little elitist, but I'm going to say it anyway. Poor and bad taste tend to be ubiquitous and eternal, but they're most often manifested in low and moderate income housing. What I'm, what I'm talking about is the neighborhoods, not just the downtown, but some of the infill housing that has gone up in the last 10 years is just awful. It seems to be car oriented, doesn't seem to want to fit in any way into the neighborhoods. When can you all expand design requirements to places, you know, outside of the central city? Well, it can't, it can't be done with a wave of a pen, for sure. Um, and I've outlined some of the reasons why it would be a real challenge for us to take on more um, design review. But I, I agree with you that that particular building type has suffered. Um, and it suffers because there's not a lot of money to pay for design. It suffers. Um, because I think there are some ideas about what those projects should look like, frankly. I think sometimes design teams walk in with um, a feeling that they need to, these buildings need to be cheery somehow, and so they often end up with kind of garish colors on them and um, kind of graphic design moves as opposed to architecture. Um, it, it's not universally true of all of the projects that have come in under the affordable housing rubric, but it, 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 it's a theme. Um, I think that we need to have more of this sort of work going on in the neighborhoods. I absolutely agree. There are a number of projects I can think of that I go by every day that look like you could take them apart with your hands. And you know, that's just not good for the long-term quality of life in Portland. That being said, you know, there's a conversation that we have. We have a developer on our commission, Ben Kaiser, who does a lot of work in North Portland. And there's a real challenge that we face. More expensive architecture and pouring more money into buildings naturally raises rent. It makes it more expensive to occupy the building. So does including parking, by the way. When you park a building, when you park cars on the land that would otherwise be occupied by people, it costs more to rent the parts that are occupied by people. So those are issues that are fundamentally opposed to each other sometimes. We have a lot of people come and be really upset about the parking situation. But we also have a lot of people that we need to house. So there's a bigger conversation that we have to have at the city about how to address these struggles in a more collective way. How can we address the parking problem on a neighborhood level, not on a building by building level? How can we talk about how all of these elements fit together rather than making each design team have to figure it out on their own on, on a schedule and on a tight budget. Um, and I would like to see the city convene more of those conversations and show more leadership, frankly, in, in those arenas. May I add, um, I don't accept that it's axiomatic that an expensive building is good and that an inexpensive building can't be good. Uh, there's no excuse for a building not to be well designed. I want to add something. Um, you know, I think there's also some leadership here involved. I mean, when you have one or two, three maybe, uh, developers doing the same building all over the city with the same architecture firm, it would seem to me that the mayor could make a phone call. <laughs> you know, I mean, seriously. Name's here, Randy. Yeah. I'm just about to, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you can go around and see it. In fact, they're not even putting up their signs on the buildings anymore, I, I've, I've noticed, because, you know, uh, uh, the firm in question that's been doing it I just isn't doing it, isn't even putting up their signs anymore on these buildings. But the fact is they've been doing them all over the city, so it seems like t to me that a little bit of political pressure would certainly help matters in the interim. And they agreed. And th there's also, I mean, here's, Here's the, the place where planning and design commission um, sort of trip over each other. If, if the planning uh, envelopes and guidelines were well set for a place like Belmont or Division, where you have um, 
an allowance for a 65 foot uh, building on half a block and behind is grandma's single family house. Th that, that's, that is a planning uh, conundrum that needs to be tackled that frequently lands in Gwen's lap at, at design commission. She can't really do anything about it, so now it's just heartburn. And, and a developer takes advantage, could, could take advantage of that. Well, if there's no rules, I'm just gonna do what, what I can do. <coughs> Next question. Uh, Andrew Wheeler, uh, member. I want to commend uh, Messrs. Russell and McCulloch for talking about prescriptions. That has concerned me more than anything. I was involved in writing standards at one time, and that worried me more than anything else. I don't think we're gonna get exceptional buildings if we overprescribe. Uh, but I do have another question, rather than a commendation. <laughs> uh, what, d can I get your opinions on the Portland building? What should happen with it or to it? It's a little off topic, but let's go there. What the heck? Well, it turns out uh, Fred Miller, who is the interim chief financial officer, uh, asked a group of us to take a look at that very issue. Um, Tom Walsh uh, of Walsh Construction, um, Bing Sheldon of Sarah Architects, Rob Ball, uh, one other and, and I, and, when, and we've met a couple of times, and I think we have differing opinions about it. Um, I think it's true, and there's, uh, there's about a 30 minute answer, so I, I can't do that. I think that it's true that the people in the building don't like it. Uh, I also think it's true that they believe that somehow if they get a new building, it's going to be the Taj Mahal. Well, they had a new building. It's called the Portland Building, and it was 20 years old. Sheldon believes that the glass vertical uh, elements of the building, that those opaque spandrels can be opened up and put an enormous amount more light, which is the common complaint, into the building uh, on all four sides. And uh, I, I just think it's a national landmark building. I happen to dislike it from the outside, but it is a national landmark building. The city owns it, the city commissioned it, and I think the city ought to expend the money to fix it up. Uh, and oh, actually, one of the other members is Roger Roper of the State Historic Preservation Office. Anyway, what was the question? Uh, uh, <laughs> let's go back on topic, because we could talk a lot about that. Next step. Um, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, what I hear is that the design review applies only basically to the core, uh, the CBD, the, the downtown. Um, and yet there are issues out in the uh, neighborhoods um, which are to some degree planning and some degree um, visual and what the buildings look like. I'll give you two examples. One is um, the um, uh, the parking requirements for multifamily buildings where there are no requirements 50 or less. Um, the other was the Trader Joe's situation where the minority in the neighborhood basically said we weren't uh, consulted and um, so they stopped it. And uh, I asked the mayor about that, and he said, oh, well, it's too far gone. We can't change anything. Um, so I, I guess my question is, is what should design review apply also out in the neighborhoods? Okay. So first, um, just to give people an idea of basically where we're operating and where we're not, certainly the central city, so that includes the area around the Rose Quarter, um, downtown, the Pearl, Northwest, South Waterfront, um, we actually have a design district out in the Selwood, Moreland area. We have one in Gateway. And there is one on the Williams Avenue Interstate Corridor. So there are some neighborhoods that have it and some that don't. Um, and, you know, things that happen like the, the Trader Joe's, that wasn't even a building yet. So design review wouldn't have helped with that. Having early conversations with the neighborhood about what they wanted to see there might have happened, might have helped. Planning level conversations would have helped. We never even got to see that one born. Um, so I think that really what you're seeing is a disconnect between 
the neighborhoods and the, the drawings that apply to their neighborhoods, these maps with pretty colored boxes drawn around some streets and not others with numbers on them that don't really mean anything until a building comes out of those pretty drawings. And um, if I had a way to do a better job of educating citizens about what can be built over their back fence or educating a buyer before they bought something so they understood what could be built over their back fence, I would do it. I mean, I, I, and, and I want to do it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm open to ideas about that. Um, it, the problem that Mike outlined is that a lot of times all those pretty colored boxes become a real thing on our doorstep after somebody has bought a piece of property and understands that they can build to 65 or 100 feet on that piece of property because the zone says so. And so, yes, we have discretion. We could peel a, a, a floor off there, or we can insist that they do this thing as opposed to the other thing, but within reason. So we get to decide what that reason is, but it's, it's not an easy conversation. And I would like to see more, again, more conversations with the citizens on the ground about what this all means. Okay, we have one time, uh, time for one quick question, uh, and then we gotta get to our memo. It's a very quick question. B.J. Seymour, City Club member. Um, given that we have design review in Portland, how did we get something as ugly as the Portland building? <laughs> it actually predates it, yeah. It yeah. yeah. Uh, Actually, the answer is more complicated. It was the result of a competition, a beauty competition, and it won. Yeah, well, it's way more complicated than that, let me tell you. Because uh, 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 everybody wants to diss uh, uh, design competition. Okay, one idea that you're sending to, uh, 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 to uh, the mayor's office about improvements to design review, real quick. Um, try to streamline the process. Uh, charge planning with uh, creating context maps that the design commission can uh, judge the individual projects upon. Gwen? Um, I'd like the city to start thinking about what the city of the future looks like. What does the city look like when we start having driverless cars and fewer of them? Indeed. Thank you so much. Okay. We have run out of broadcast time for further questions. We'll have to stop for the day. And as we close, please join me in offering our sincere thanks to our moderator, Randy Gregg, and our panelists, Michael McCulloch, Guinevere Milius, and John Russell. <laughs>